So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our lecture series on uncreative digital writing. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Nick Montfort as our today's speaker. Nick Montfort is a computational artist and poet and a scholar of digital art and media. He's professor of digital media at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where he directs a lab called Trope Tank. The aim of Trope Tank and here I will quote the trope tank itself, is to develop new poetic practices and new understandings of digital media by focusing on the material, formal, and historical aspects of computation and language. And these words also capture Nick Montfort's poetic works. He is the author of a large number of computer-generated poems and novels, which have been broadly discussed in literature and literary studies. From his wide oeuvre, I would like to mention Megawatt, a kind of sequel or intensification of Samuel Beckett's well-known novel, What? I want to show you how this looks like. You can see this here in my picture on the left side, the novel itself. And on the right side, you, you can see the code. So you can download the code underlying this text and execute it by yourself and generate the text by yourself. And um, what you see here is indeed a crucial feature of Mr. Montfort's work, the code underlying the text as their output is co-published and, and thus part of the artwork itself. But this then gives us reason to go beyond the referential meaning of the text and instead think about the nature of the textual, the digital and the programmability of language and sound. And in his Today's talk, Literature and the Computational Arts, Nick Montfort will present his idea of computer-generated poetry as part of the computational arts. I'm very glad to have you here tonight. Um, it's your turn. Danke für das uh, Welkommen. Guten Tag. Um, I know some German, but you just heard all of it, I'm sorry to say but I'm very glad to be here and to have the chance to share my perspective on literature and the computational arts. To begin, I want to explain what my premise is for today. I will be going through some historical work, four of the pieces of early computational literature that I find particularly compelling. And I'll also be discussing a few recent projects that have happened just in the past few years. But the reason I bring all of these up is because I'm not sure that it's right to think of computational literature as if literary activity, writing and poetry were the foremost things that were going on and that computation was somehow the adjective. It was being used to infuse the literary process or inflect the literary process or cause something new to happen. Instead, I think that it might be best to consider that there are computational arts, including computational music, computational visual art, computational performance of various sorts. And computational literature, instead of being best understood as a species of literature, might be understood as a type of creative computing alongside some of these other arts. And we might therefore want to resituate what computational literature or digital literature is. In fact, if we look beyond institutions like this talk series, which I'm glad to see accepts computing alongside other types of literary interventions, if we look out to the broader world, we may find that institutions are already suggesting to us and stating to us that we actually find computational literature among these other computational arts. We don't find it in the normal literary ways. Let me begin by going through a few early pieces of 
digital writing. And I'm going to start with what is possibly the first creative writing done on the computer. What you have here is what I hope has been established as a formally accurate re-implementation of Christopher Strachey's Love Letter Generator from 1952. I say it's formally accurate because it is the same type of machine for love letter generation. The way it produces texts should be the same as the original process, as far as I've been able to determine. If anyone has a better idea, the source code is available as free and open source software. So anyone can make a modification to the program and can suggest another idea. I should point out though, that this is not how this particular text appeared materially. It was printed out, it was hung on a bulletin board placed on a bulletin board um, when it was being generated back in the early 1950s. However, what those texts were formally were things like this. Jewel Moppet, my fellow feeling devotedly tempts your eager rapture. You are my sweet eagerness. My liking pants for your rapture. My thirst covetously pines for your love. You are my loving rapture, yours tenderly, Manchester University computer. Here you have an intervention into a minor genre of literature, the letter, specifically the love letter. And although Christopher Strachey was intervening perhaps as a prank, perhaps from the standpoint of parody, he did later write about this project in an art magazine, Encounter. And as a, this may not be understood, strictly speaking, as poetry or as a poetic endeavor. It's nevertheless something involved with literary and the letter. Christopher Strachey, incidentally, was also, as far as we know, the first person to have the computer generate music and produce music. So I want to move on to another project from only a few years later. And that is a project by Taylor Lutz. And we have here also, I've provided an English version of his stochastic text that is formally doing the same thing that his process did, although it's been translated to English. If you want to see what the original German text that was produced looked like materially, this is an image of one of the outputs, one of the printed outputs from 1959. Now I have the chat window open, so I want to find out, uh, maybe I also uh, will open my uh, participants window if I can. I may have to stop sharing in order to do that and share again. Let me let me find out of of all of you. So how many of you can you uh, raise your your virtual yellow hand? Just like just like this. Can you raise your hand if you know of Teolut's work, if you're familiar with this stochastic text? All right, and uh, so thank you. And I want to check also because I don't know how many of you can find that hand raising button. So if you're not familiar with Theo Lutz's stochastic text, please raise your hand. I, I got a few people who are letting me know in chat. I'm trying to figure out the actual ratio here. All right, good. So let me ask those of you who um, have access to the, to the chat window here. Um, 
where do you think this language came from? Where did Teolutz take this? His lexicon, his word hoard. How did he get this vocabulary to put into his combinatorial system that produces these sentences at random, these propositions at random? Does anyone have a guess as to where, where it may have come from? Go ahead and type uh, into the chat window if you have any thought about this. Now, it seems like it might be in the form of verse because we're presented with lines. Of course, we might also be presented with sentences. Ah, I do think that it comes from Kafka. I think that this vocabulary is drawn from the castle specifically. And I find this extremely compelling because taking a work which is about this nonsensical type of encounter with reality, and putting together these propositions that don't particularly mean anything, a proposition saying one thing could be just as likely as one saying the opposite, is to me an excellent joining of the form and the particular vocabulary, the particular content of words. And here we have this happening even before the 1960s, back in 1959. I'll move along to look at another project that's in English that Victor Ingve did, Random Sentences. And this is a project based on a particular children's book, the first 10 sentences of a children's book. Um, Ingve wanted to determine all of the possible syntactic ways that language could recombine everything that had the seed of those 10 sentences. And so he got a system that produces recursively all types of language from it has it to when an engine in his water has small, an engine four driving wheels and engineer small, engineer small is proud of it. Now, some of these sentences are redundant. This one that I just read mentions small, a particular person, engineer small, as two of the items in a list. Some of them are very unusual. They have semantic problems, but they capture something about the way language works. And they might be more interesting and provocative for those sorts of contradictions. So this is another random sentence generator, but different than Theo Lutz because it includes the recursive generation of phrases and clauses. Now, by 1967, we arrive at something that everyone agrees is poetry a poetry generator developed by Alison Knowles in collaboration with composer James Tenney. It's called A House of Dust. And it produces things looking like stanzas, looking like poetic language that's lineated verse in these quatrains, these four line stanzas. A house of paper 
on open ground using candles inhabited by very tall people, a house of roots in southern France using electricity inhabited by little boys. And so all throughout this generation process, we're being presented with images of different houses. And there are many different types of materials the house can be made from and a variety of places it can be situated, different sites and different people who can inhabit it. But interestingly, there are only four options for lighting, only four different ways that the house can be lit. And one of the things I find interesting about this is that it isn't abundant in all of its different options. Some of these options are very few and some of these options are many. And to me, that is more interesting than having just lots and lots of text that's possible to recombine. And there's many other, way, other reasons that this is an interesting piece. Allison Knowles actually constructed one of the houses that was generated by this Fortran computer program as part of this art project. And that sums up what I wanted to say about the history in the 50s and 60s of computer generated text, of computational writing and poetry. As you can see already by the end of the 1960s, there were diverse efforts, even though the combination of a few bits of text was a principle behind all of this. A House of Dust is not a parody of poetry the way that love letters was a parody of a particular type of phatic form of the sweet nothings that people would exchange with each other. We have random sentences that were bizarre and uncanny presented to us based on a novel by Kafka and some based on a children's book that nevertheless turned out to be somewhat bizarre and uncanny because of the way that they syntactically duplicated themselves without recognition of their underlying semantics. And so I think you see there's already something interesting happening from uh, 60 to 70 years in the past. So I'd like to move and then in the second section of my talk here, give you a little bit of a perspective on what's been going on in the past few years, really just in the past five years or so. And I'll start by uh, sharing with you a piece, The Seeker by Lee Zeles, that was exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum, but was first created for an event called NanoGenmo, National Novel Generation Month. NanoGenmo happens every November. It just happened. And it's uh, a misnamed event. First of all, it's not national. Anyone in the world can participate. And secondly, it's actually not about generating novels. It's about generating books. And almost none of the books are novels or even have a relationship to the novel. Many of them are visual poetry works. Many of them are conceptual projects. And that certainly includes the work I've done during NanoGenmo. But the project originated because of something called National Novel Writing Month, NanoRemo, which is an activity that also takes place in November. Darius Kazimi thought that if we could write a 50,000 word novel in a month, wouldn't it be much easier, but also fun, if we were willing to generate 50,000 word novels in a month. And so this project is one of the most significant events, I believe, in the recent history of computer generated writing and the recent practice that I and others have undertaken. I'm going to show you here um, an image from one page of Lizella's The Seeker as it appeared 
in the art of box. An exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum. You can see at the top, initiate dream sequence system ready. What you find in this work and the pages have a different visual appearance as you'll see in a moment. They don't all have this format, but what you find in this work is a trace of the computer itself thinking conceptually, trying to understand about the world, trying to dream. And in some ways, the format of system logs comes into this in some ways, aspects of visual poetry. Here's another view of the seeker at this particular installation. And you can see a little bit more that some pages don't have any alphabetic characters on them. They just have punctuation marks and other glyphs. and others appear in different formats, and some of them are more textual. The Seeker is one of the breakout projects from NanoGenmo, and at a glance, which I'm giving you now, I hope you understand my assertion that these National Novel Generation Month projects aren't all about the novel, and they certainly aren't all novels. They indulge in the idea of an artist's book, of the idea of a book-length visual poem quite often. So I want to move on from there to talk about a work by Alison Parrish, Articulations. And the best way to share this with you, there's, there's a few possibilities I could, I can show you um what a page spread looks like so there's two parts to this book the first part typeset as prose in paragraphs the second part um lineated and these parts both use unconventional methods of finding similarity between different lines of verse. And the lines of verse are found in the Project Gutenberg corpus, a large body of work, mostly in the English language. And English language lines of verse have been extracted from this. That's the first part of Alison Parrish's project to actually build a corpus of verse lines from a website holding text of all different sorts. Then the lines are broken into phonetic components and the similarity between these components in a vector space model is determined. And finally, a random walk is used to traverse through this vector space, making sure that we don't go back to previous lines as we walk through that space. I have a little bit of this to share with you verbally because this is a project where the sound of the language is very important. And by the way, I don't expect anyone to follow along. If you can follow along, please let me know in the chat what you think the meaning of this is because I don't know myself. It's something that uh, presents to me an experience of sound. It indulges in what poets have been seeking throughout the centuries, ways to connect language based on the sounds of that language, but it does so in a very unconventional way, not something that is based on traditional meter and rhyme properties. I shall it take, I shall take it kindly. Like a stately ship, I patient lie. The patient night, the patient head, O oh, patient hand, O oh, patient life, O oh, patience, patience. Patience, patience, he said, nay, patience. Patience, little boy, 
a shape of the shapeless night, the spacious round of the creation shape, the seashore, the station of the Gresham ships. In the ship, the men she stationed between the shade and the shine, between the sunlight and the shade, between the sunset and the night, between the sunset and the sea, between the sunset and the rain, a taint in the sweet air, when the setting sun, the setting sun. The setting day, a snake said, it's a cane, it's a kill, is like a stain, like a stream, like a dream. And like a dream, sits like a dream, sits like a queen, shine like a queen. When like a fish, like a shell, fled like a shadow, like a shadow still, lies like a shadow still, I like a flash of light, shall I like a fool, quoth he, you shine like a lily, like a mute, shall I languish? And still, I like Alaska. And so a little bit there of articulations, something that certainly doesn't sound like traditional poetry, although the organizing principles of it, how each bit of verse, each line is linked to another before they're gathered up into these paragraphs, uh, certainly has a relationship to poetic practice. So I want to move along to talk about another project. You'll find that Alison Parrish and Lee Zellis not only are participants in National Novel Generation Month, but have also been bot makers. They've indulged in the practice of creating automated programs to post for artistic purposes on Twitter, among other social networks. And one of the major projects in the form of a Twitter bot is Ranjit Bhatnagar's Pentamitron. I want to show you a little bit about what it does. It works differently than some of these other projects in that it uses existing found language on Twitter. Ranjit has managed to get access to the so-called fire hose. Um, a large number of tweets on Twitter being available, he can then filter these to find the ones that do have traditional metrical properties that are in iambic pentameter, the most common verse meter in English, and ones that rhyme with each other so as to produce couplets. So while Alison Parrish is looking at poetic similarity along radically different lines, Ranjit Matnagar's pentametron takes the radically different sort of language that we find online and applies very traditional means of assembling it into these heroic couplets. And so here are some examples. These were generated back in October of 2018. You can see that uh, Pentamitron simply retweets what other people have said, once it determines that other people's tweets are in the correct metrical form and that they rhyme, it puts them together by retweeting them. And so I'll read just the text of four of these tweets. Okay, 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 okay. So many realizations for today. Chick-fil-A, a breakfast always hits the spot. You're gonna let a sister shoot her shot. Now, while Pentamitron was well known as a bot and presented this online experience that you could get in your Twitter feed, you could go and look at while you were looking at human discourse on Twitter as well, Ranjit also developed a novel for National Novel Generator Month, uh, for National Novel Generation Month. Um, I got an alligator for a pet, and then since then has done a book for the small press Counterpath. And Counterpath is also the publisher of Alison Parrish's articulations. And it is uh, my series, Using Electricity, named after a line from A House of Dust, that, uh, that these books appear in. And uh, encomials, Sonnets from Pentamitron represents the most recent book publication that 
Ranjit did, bringing together this work from online in a new type of vernacular, but placing it in the framework of a very high register, a very refined um, sort of verse system. And uh, so I'm going to share with you one more work from recent years. And this is also one that, uh, that I am involved with the publication of. In this case, I'm the publisher of it um, through my very small press, Bad Quarto. So in 2017, I published 31 instances of this book for the sleepers in that quiet earth by Sophie and Audrey. And uh, I have to say instances rather than copies because the books are not copies of each other. Each one is unique. Um, the books uh, begin in a way that um, looks rather unlike a standard text. But as one progresses, and I'll show you a few photographs online where you can see them a little better. But as one progresses through this book, uh, the text becomes increasingly familiar and coherent. And so at a particular stage, you'll see things that begin to look like words, but are not legible. At a later point, chapter headings will appear. And the book can be read, although it might be somewhat errant. There might be orthographic and other types of deviations and variations. And the way in which this project is put together is through a recurrent neural network, uh, a model that uses only a single source of data, Wuthering Heights. So all it knows about the English language comes from this one book, from this single novel. And instead of presenting this after training has been done, each of the different epochs is represented along the way as the system learns more and more about language through this particular novel. Now, there have been many things that have changed since the 50s and 60s. So obviously, the particular technologies that have been used vary. We don't uh, have exclusively combinatorial types of uh, means of putting language together using linear algorithms, for instance. We have machine learning techniques, vector space models. Uh, we have other types of uh, conceptual networks that are employed. And uh, this obviously is an, represents important um, new directions that people have been taking. Um, but I think even more important than particular new technologies than any, for instance, uh, corporate language model that has been introduced in recent years are these events like NanoGenmo, um, the exhibition of work at a prestigious art gallery, um, the ways in which people have formed a community of practice by identifying, for instance, as bot makers. And so um, it's that development of a community of computer writers, computer poets, if we want to call them that, um, that has made the biggest difference in my own practice and the way I engage with this type of work. But I want to question the idea that being a computer writer or being a computer poet is really the right way to characterize the activity or the identity of the people involved, as opposed to saying that the people who've been doing this work are engaged in creative computing. 
they're people who are computational artists and they have practices that involve language and literature. In other words, instead of saying that this is a writing activity, a poetry activity, a literary activity first, and then computing is somehow involved. Let's imagine that the computational art is what's central. Um, and the way I want to start a conversation about that is simply by sharing a little information about the eight people who are involved in the productions, the particular literary works, computational literary works that um, I've already gone over, that I've discussed with you. And so, let's see here, once I get, once I get this in the proper view, Here we are. Um, good. We can take a look at who these people are. I already mentioned that Christopher Stracci was um, the first person to develop computer music of any sort, as far as we know. So his creative endeavors with the computer were not limited to the literary ones that we saw. And um, on Wikipedia nowadays, if we go to an encyclopedic source, he will be characterized as a computer scientist. That's a little bit of a presentist view because there was no one in 1952 who was a computer scientist. The discipline did not exist under that name yet, but for the types of work that a mathematician that people engaged with computing were doing, um, it's the work that we now call computer science. So let's say Christopher Strachey was a computer scientist. Um, Theo Lutz in the German Wikipedia has a similar designation. Victor Ingve is called a professor of linguistics, which he was first at MIT and then at University of Chicago. Allison Knowles, is referred to as a visual artist, which I think is very limiting. Uh, her work is also in performance. She did a lot with uh, others in the flexus movement. Um, but nevertheless, she's definitely thought more uh, of as an artist than a writer. And I didn't mention her collaborator, James Tenney, who facilitated the project, but as I said, um, his identity was as a composer. Now, this more recent group also has curious types of um, names for what it is they do. Lee Zellers calls himself language hacker and bot maker. Um, Allison Parrish does use the term poet, but only after computer programmer. And game designer is also included there. Ranjit Bhatnagar works in music installation and text, according to his biography in Encomials. And Sophia and Audrey creates computational artworks. So my question for us to discuss might be phrased as, where are the writers? Where are the people who come from a literary background and standpoint who are doing this type of innovative computational work? Now, I've only shown a selection of projects, hopefully not too biased. There certainly are people who are very well known and ratified as writers and who have produced prize-winning works of computational writing such as Lillian von Bertram, whose Travesty Generator is an extraordinary book, extraordinary publication. Um, so I don't mean to say that there's no one who identifies as a poet or a writer or is part of writing communities 
more than computing or digital media or digital art communities. But I find uh, that from the early days until today, many people have influences that come across the different arts. And it may be that the work that those of us who are developing computational literature are undertaking, that uh, perhaps it's the computing that is most fundamental. Perhaps the conversations that we should be having are conversations with people engaged in computational music and computational visual art and computational performance. And I have to say, in many cases, the external institutions tend to agree with us. Because, for instance, Alison Parrish's articulations, um, as far as I know, received one review from an arts organization, Rhizome, not uh, from a literary magazine. And if you want to actually see or experience offline, not on the internet, um, Lee Zellis's The Seeker, you would go to a museum. You would go to that exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was up in 2016. So uh, we don't find a lot of this work in libraries or at bookstores, although I've been undertaking to make more of that happen through my work with small press publishing. Um, those are the questions I have to ponder, whether it makes sense, for instance, to have other series of talks about contemporary cutting edge writing and literary practices, and to bring some computer people in as part of those, or whether it makes sense to have a conversation about computational art more broadly. So um, I do have a work that's a recent collaboration of mine, never presented in a literary context, but containing text, working in literary modes, among others. And so we can turn to that work, but I want to do that after we have some conversation about this overall topic, about whether it's really computational literature that we should be focusing on and talking about, or does it make more sense to turn that formulation around and discuss creative computing that engages with literary art? Thanks very much.